Ralph. This could be for any of the speakers, but um, we've, we've had, um, speaking some fabricators, uh, they've said they wouldn't trust the models from design teams, and they would prefer to rebuild the models from the 2D drawings. So it was interesting to hear that some of you are using the IFC models directly. This, is that just a sort of cultural attitude of some of the fabricators, or is it, is it a real problem? Essentially, it's, um, it is a cultural problem. And if we go back 25 years ago, people would say, oh, uh, I don't want to use a cam drawing because it might be false dimension. That's no longer an issue. And if you're working with the models like a Revit model or a Benton model or a Nemechek model, they're all, they have to be accurate. The problem at some stages is, I'll show you carefully. <laughs> The consult consultants have ownership of the model and they've spent a lot of money developing that model. And there are still checks and balances required. But if they hand over a model and there's an error in it, they hand it over with reservation that you're still responsible to check it. Whereas that doesn't change whether money you've got a 2D drawing or a 3D model. But conceptually, people seem to think that, oh, it's a 3D model, it must be right. So it, it, it's only conceptual. Um, drawings can be false as well, so there's no, no difference really. In fact, I actually would trust a 3D model more than a 2D drawing. Do, uh, do you have to uh, Michael or Keith, do you want to come to that answer? I suppose it's just reiterating what Dennis said there, probably it's coming from a cultural um, perspective, but again, there is more, I personally will put more faith in receiving a 3D model because um, the general arrangements, which ultimately are issued from the 3D model, if, if something is modeled incorrectly, then the general arrangements are generated automatically and it's dimensioned automatically. So therefore, it is, you know, it's more likely to be correct than, let's say, coming from a 2D um, CAD drawing where the ability is there to, I suppose, manipulate dimensions. There has been in the past where guys are putting in things to scale and they type over dimensions and so on. Whereas when you're being issued a 3D model, um, you can't fool the model. It's either, you know, it's either right or it's not right. Um, and if you receive the model plus a set of, of 2D drawings, then the 2D drawings, if they've been generated correctly from the model, will relate directly back to the information from it and the dimensional output will correspond with the model itself. Um, and I suppose just dealing with the, the IFC input for, from our experience, um, importing IFC models into Tecla, um, it's not quite there yet, but it's, it's gotten better over the past couple of years. Um, but generally, the information that you get, um, was I said earlier, there's a, there's a macro tool to convert to Tecla objects. Um, some of those objects, even after you do the conversion, will only appear as a, a wire line diagram within the model. But that wire line diagram will still contain the information telling you that it should be a 203 UC volume or whatever it should be. Um, so you can still even modify that wireframe um, line within the model to change it to um, a 3D type of object within it. So, you know, there are ways to develop it even further. As I said, you know, it, it fast tracks the, the 3D modeling and the connection detailing process um, by receiving the model. Go ahead, Dave. Here we are. Yeah. Um, <coughs> just, this is probably to Dennis or Michael. Um, do you integrate the model with your analysis software? Um, as well, and if so, do you do it in a bi-directional fashion? Structural analysis software. Again, that comes down to the level of um, information that's being required. So, 95% of the time, all you have is connection design. The problem with connection design is we don't have the connection information in the 3D model. So, unless you have that, you can't use the model for that information. So you're doing it manually on computer software and feeding it back. If, if it was supplied as part of a, for example, an IFC, it can be supplied as part of the IFC data. 
set. And there are tools which will then allow you to integrate that into uh, various analysis packages. But currently, that information is not being passed on, so you can't use it. If you were doing it as a, a design build, which is only 5% of the time, the opportunities are there. But at this stage, currently, I'm not using them anyway. Um, thank you. Uh, this is Marjorie. Um, I was going to ask um, Dennis, um, you were encouraging that designers would say architects or engineers would actually send you the 3D models. Um, from my experience with working with some of them, um, they might be concerned about the integrity of, of their design. So uh, I heard in further presentations of this clash check or validation process, once you then put all your fabrication um, type data into the model, is there a way then that the architect or engineer, depending on what type of project it was, could validate that the integrity of their original design is still there, that you haven't sort of chopped off a bit or something, you know? Yeah. Um, <laughs> the, the reality is what, what you're getting is you're getting a, a copy of the model. You're not getting your working model. So all that we are actually doing is we're, we're starting with the copy, we're reinterpreting it, and that is what goes back. And then software, in all the software houses, will do comparisons between two IFC models. So if, for example, uh, there was a problem, a column was moved for, example, 100 mil, then it couldn't be moved for 100 mil, the software will actually highlight this and say, sorry, between this IFC and the new one, it's moved for 100 mil. So it actually makes it easier to find if something was inadvertently placed in the wrong position or deliberately moved for another reason. But your each individual company owns their data set. You're not handing it over and lose control. So there is that, that really isn't an issue. It's more uh, collaboration of feeding information back and forth. Thank you. Thank you. If, if I can just do some sure. of the mic here. I wanted to ask Michael. Um, when you talked about the um, Tekla model can issue 3D drawings for approval, um, does the software generate some sort of a drawing issue sheet um, automatically, or you know, are, are issue sheets a thing of the past now that we're into this realm? No, I mean, 3D issues, or drawing issue sheets are still very much part of the documentation control process. Um, the generation of the 3D drawing, I suppose, is a 3D image which has been generated from the software, um, which will contain all of the relevant information for that particular image or part of the project as such. Um, the drawing numerical sequence is also created automatically within the software program, and that then is inputted into the <coughs> drawing issue sheet and issued with, let's say, your drawings for approval. So be that in a 2D PDF format or a 3D IFC model, um, that is still very much part of the control process in terms of what's been received. Okay, and sorry, just for clarity, so does the, does the, does the software generate that issue sheet or do you physically sort of say, I've now extracted you know, 52 drawings out of the model and, and you then have to list them? Um, I suppose currently we're importing it, it can be exported to an Excel spreadsheet um, directly from the model, and that's how we would monitor our drawing issue sheets. So, yeah. Many thanks. Just uh, a second, Dan. Um, hold on to that. There's plenty more questions. You're not off the hook yet. Good morning. Uh, it's a question for Keith. Uh, Keith, you mentioned the project, Corbin project. Maybe just is that some form of demonstration project, a research project, or what are we trying to achieve with that? Okay, yeah, it's actually, um, it, it's, it's not a proof of concept or a pilot or an academic project, it's a, it's a live project and it's aiming to, to extend their, their product, which was primarily a, a project management project collaboration uh, web-based system to allow the, the main contractor and all of the uh, subcontractors and, and, and relevant third parties to collaborate and I guess you know share documents, drawings, etc. In, in terms of the building uh, project lifecycle, 
but it's now effectively moved forwards to a point where you can actually uh, do model checking, clash detection in, in a web browser. So I think they've kind of um, coined the, the phrase BIM in a browser. It's effectively a, a web-based IFC um, solution that sits within their project management tool set. So it's trying to drive collaborative BIM really in a, in a kind of a real-world scenario to, to their existing client base. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. So you're regarding it primarily as a site-based tool, is it a tool to aid site work? Yeah, I guess it, it's to, you know, they use that tool set for, for many different reasons and, and depending on who you are and your role in the project, you'll have a different use for it, but the, the, the fact is in the past it was really a document management tool and you have to yes. download the document and open that document in the relevant application on your yes. desktop. Um, it's now got to the point where you can do um, screen sharing, as I say, model merging, checking, validation, uh, class detection online in the web browser. So you don't have to have the, the, the expensive specialist tool sets to, to collaborate with those people. So I guess people who are maybe um, involved at a higher level or, or less at the sharp end have still got the ability to, to interface with the team. So it's just more of a, a kind of a, a web-based uh, or cloud-based, if you like, collaborative tool, but it allows the, the, the BIM capability in a web browser. So it's, I think one of the things they, they're trying to do is to make sure that um, the Ministry of Justice and Ministry of Defence and people like that who have very strict IT policies, it, it would work in their environment. So zero footprint in terms of uh, the, the browser and the, the PC that it was running from, sure. just to allow that, that, that work yes. with the public sector project. Yes. But I suppose very briefly what it does show, it shows you know, a third level institute and an IT company and a contractor coming together collaboratively on a project that presumably they bid for this project, they won the research funding for it. So, you know, there's nothing stopping uh, an IT company <coughs> coming together with some of the members, for example, in CETA and looking for independent funding from like Enterprise Ireland. The four project is traditionally a collaborative tool. Um, so it's just interesting to see something like that coming forward. But sure. Um, I have any. Oh, there is one more. I have a question too. I'm just being patient. Uh, a question maybe for, for Dennis, just in relation to importing the IFSC model in from the structural designer. In terms of the additional information that might be required for you know, a detailed model, so just construction nodes, pinned or remote connections, shear studs, how is that being um, transmitted in terms of, you know, is it in the IFSC model within each you know, beam? Is that being um, put in there? Is it a, a schedule? Um, Currently, it's not to be drawn. Again, with, with the new codes and the number of load cases that are being generated, you can have a model with 60 to 100 load cases. Um, that's enough, and you have your six different axes of information per node. That's an awful lot of information to be added into an IFC format. It gets very cumbersome. And in reality, you don't look at all 100 load cases. Um, so currently, it, it, it was discussed recently at another meeting I was at as to whether or not it was feasible. And the answer is technologically, no problem. Practically, not so certain how useful it would be. Um, because at the end of the day, you don't design every single connection. You, you do rationalize. So then the question is, how, how much rationalization can you do simply without having to go down, get the balance right? But at the moment, it's all on 2 d and sorry, just the second question in, in terms of just the overall, in terms of uh, clash detection showing construction, um, you know, the, you know, steel beams can fit and they're not clashing with branches. Just, is that done manually or does the software? Uh, that, that's automatic in the software that we use. Um, so we've been doing that for 20 years. Uh, so before you issue it for fabrication, it must, you do a clash check. It will do it, it through an IFC format into any of the other three third parties. Are the batteries gone? <coughs> um, you all mentioned kind of after last question or around the ball mentioned that you need to interrogate every three demands you get from a demanding member. Uh, kind of percentage wise, what kind of interrogation time do you spend as opposed to rebuilding one? Again, that's difficult in that we're getting very few 3D models. <coughs> I only have one instance so far. 
Uh, I have done a test with another uh, client, and literally it was because of the complex, with a lot of curves in it, uh, we brought it in to have a look, and to be honest, we wouldn't have been able to use the data. The, the IFC conversion just didn't work well. Uh, so, but I mean, it's no different. As you're doing it, you'll, you'll do some spot checks. But what can you do if you've got a 3D model or if you've got a 2D drawing? If you've got a 2D drawing, you can check what, was it dimensioned to the correct point. But in a 3D model, it's very little checking <laughs> other than site dimensions. So if you're replacing something or if you're working a refurb job, you can go in and do a survey and say, well, that column is actually 50 mil away from where it was expected and adjust accordingly. It's from the 3D model. I understand that you yeah, have a beam that's 6.32059 millimeters long, it's could actually maybe possibly drilling, but with more uh, elaborate connections and that, how, how, how automated is, is the fabrication process? Currently in the industry, the, the automation relates to cutting of the beams, drilling of the beams, and the fabrication of the plates, whatever shape they are. The placement of the plates in, on complex assemblies is only just starting to come to fruition. And the problem is, is that for robotics, which is what you need for the placement of the plates, the size of the sections that you're using are so bespoke and heavy that it's fine for doing a simple beam or a column or a rafter with simple end plates, but for the complex stuff, really you can't beat the human intervention. Yeah, I can just add to that. We've um, researched ourselves in house, um, looking at more more automation in the in the workshop. Because uh, apart from uh, you correctly say, apart from cutting and drilling, um, and uh, cut shaping of plates, um, cleats and plates and uh, connections are all built up by hand using manual labour. So obviously, an automation would save money in the long run. And um, there is, and it's very much in its infancy. Uh, uh, robotic uh, machines uh, in development that will, uh, you know, they, they, they will do small, small uh, sections, and they, they will take the shaft, uh, the, the beam section or the column section, and uh, another robotic arm will add the plate to it, and another robotic arm will weld it. There's only one that I know of, uh, maybe two. Uh, there's one in Holland and another one in Germany at the moment, but uh, they are really only in development phase. Um, one is somewhat operational. But uh, the problem is in, in our game that every piece is almost always different. If it was all the same, happy days. Uh, it suits robotics for something to be all the same, such as you're making a, a Toyota Corolla, you're making a, a million of them or whatever, they're all the same, more or less. Uh, with, with our components, uh, if you have uh, 10,000 components in a job, uh, some of them may be the same, but 95% uh, you know, of them are different. Robots can't really handle that, you know? Um, it is, uh, sometime in the future, they will become more prevalent, but uh, different sizes of pieces, etc. at the moment, it's, uh, it's just not practical. But it is, the industry is moving forward, probably it's slowly uh, in, in that manner. Yeah. So, uh, could you, I, I think we have only, I, I would like to ask a question myself. I want to try and take the question from a detail level to a higher level. You have all three companies invested in uh, what I would describe as digitization. I'm interested in a very high level comment on what it has done for your competitiveness and where do you think this can go in the future? Who's going to be the brave person? Perhaps Keith, you might. Uh... Okay, uh, it's quite, quite a broad question, um, but I'll, I'll try to answer it. I think from Kingspan's point of view, um, it's very much, I guess, Kingspan's mantra to be uh, a leading provider of premium solutions, high-end solutions, etc., to, to be the market leader, not just in terms of its product capability, but also its service, service offerings. So 
I, I think it, you know our absence, if if we'd not chosen to to be a, an early adopter from a boom standpoint, that would have been a, a fairly significant negative for us. So I think it's um, you know it's it's cemented our position as being a market leader uh, in terms of product innovation as well as technology innovation. innovation. And, and as I said earlier, I think one of the the, the nice surprises that's kind of a byproduct of what we've done is that we've now started to see a lot of commercial benefits in terms of specification led selling and, and better engagement with uh, people earlier on in the process, so the design team and clients, etc. And we're able to um, allow the client to visualise what the, the end product could look like, whereas I think prior to having the 3D uh, modelling tools and tools such as Tech of that was quite difficult for, for people to envisage you know, how your products could come together. Because it's, it's quite easy when you're talking about uh, products at a component level um, to understand you know, what, what that may look like. But when you're trying to look at uh, an overall solution and how they work together and complement one another, it's, it's quite a powerful visualisation tool. Um, and I think you start to see integration between the BIM tools we've been talking about, some of the energy modelling and analysis tools, you can then start to um, drive very strong business arguments in terms of energy and cost and life cycle ownership as well. So it, it kind of supports the, the investment in, in, in the right products at the outset. So that's, that's quite a, a, a powerful thing for, for people to try and go into our tech. Thank you. Michael, perhaps, would you briefly comment and... I suppose, very simply, as, as a small detailing office, um, we couldn't exist um, without the use of, of the 3D software um, that we're currently using. Um, the scale of projects that we work on and the turnaround time that we have to produce information back to our clients in wouldn't permit us to use anything but <coughs> the, the latest 3D software. Um, so I suppose simply we, we wouldn't exist if we weren't using it. I suppose there is the initial upfront investment in the software which is expensive. There's a steep learning curve in using the software. Um, you know, if we're going to be you know, fully proficient in it, it could take anything up to 12 months in terms of using the software on a day-to-day -day basis and becoming fully um, up to speed with using it. Um, but against that, the payback um, is, is pretty significant from our perspective. You know, as I said, we're a small office. We're turning around jobs, let's say, of that 4,000 ton um, project for the likes of Eli um, Lilly. Albeit it took a number of months, but I mean, it's it's something you couldn't do with, without using it in a 3D format. Thank you. Pat. Just to answer quickly, John, um, I suppose all our competitors are using the same, same sort of software that we're using and the same sort of modeling system. So if you don't keep up to date, you're certainly going to lose your competitive edge with what you have at the moment. Um, so if you don't do it, uh, you're not in the game really, you know. Uh, just touched on the robotics there, perhaps, um, um, getting more data out onto the fabrication floor and uh, reducing costs on that, that front uh, could make companies more, more competitive. But uh, really with what we're using at the moment, which we've been, we've been using for a long time now, um, and everybody is using it as a competitive game. But the more information you get up front, probably the less time we have to spend ourselves on things and the more competitive yes. we become as well. And the less work Dennis has to do. Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> Okay, I'd just like one a round of applause for the four presenters.